Hi everyone, I'm Baden, uh, founder of Neurofights. I'll explain a bit in a bit. And today I'm here, I was asked by uh, Isabel to give a, a talk, like a quick introduction on neurotechnology and brain computer interfaces. And uh, I'm personally quite excited to actually talk about this because it's a super interesting topic and very few people have a, a clear idea of how much of an impact this most likely is going to have. And even fewer people understand how these uh, separate kind of building blocks are, are put together to make this all happen. And um, I wanted to start off with a quick quote because this quote came to mind quite a few times when building this presentation. So I will let you attach your own meaning to it, <laughs> but I think it's quite suitable. Um, Go for today is, is very simple. I want to simplify this because I think it's a super complex topic. There's a lot to be said, um, way more than we can put in a 30, 45 minute talk. But I think if you understand some of the basic principles of this entire field, then you can start doing your own Google searches. You can start doing your own YouTube searches and that's the goal. So when I started researching this field about three, four years ago, um, I had no idea where to start. I didn't have a background in psychology or, or neuroscience. I didn't have a background in technology. And I just felt like this would be uh, unreachable for me, if that makes sense. So then you have to build everything yourself. And here I tried to build a presentation that I would have wanted to see back then. Uh, and hopefully I did a bit of a good job. All right, so that's that. I'm a founder and CEO of Neurofight and a chapter lead of Neurotech Amsterdam. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about both of those. If you want to ask any questions afterwards or just connect, feel free to on uh, LinkedIn or on email. Neurified wise. So uh, super short introduction. We started this about three years ago, uh, me and a like a PhD in neuropsychology. And the idea was just to simplify behavioral psychology and neuroscience because we know an amazing amount about how people tend to think, decide and behave, but it's very complex and abstract and 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 often theoretical so what we do is like we use all the science uh, we we gather the team of seven cognitive neuropsychologists and we simplify all the science and make it practical uh, with training and consulting um and then the other part is neurotech x uh, this was started by a few people in montreal in canada and it's a global community like the biggest community i know at least on uh, neurotechnology and they have a Slack channel, uh, which I'll show you later on. And yeah, like if you want to learn more about this, this is the way to go. So I thought at least let's introduce this. But of course, what we're here for today is uh, actually neurotechnology and what it is, uh, same for BCI. So let's kick off with neurotechnology. I hope most of you have no or just barely an idea. And I would love to hear how that prediction was afterwards. So I thought, okay, you're you're mostly um, developers, or at least you 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 uh, understand technology. So I thought, let's pick the the point where technology becomes neurotechnology, and essentially, it's when it fundamentally changes how we think about our brain or about ourselves. And of course, you can go into the very complex topic of let's say further defining consciousness, but I think that's one of the later things we will do. Right? Um, thought is something that is a bit more achievable. Uh, understanding more how people tend to think and uh, higher order activities in this case is literally just thinking, planning, all of those um, kind of activities where um, you have to think very hard, very consciously. And we'll get into that a bit. So before we kick off, uh, the idea today is mostly to give you a bit of a primer in terms of what is the, the, the science and the technology that is built on in a very simple way. And then on top of that, a bunch of use cases. So what is out there in the market? What do, do people already use this for? How did they combine these kind of things? Um, so what do you need to know from neuroscience? Very simple, this one thing. <laughs> in the end, your brain is like, it's a network and it has a lot of uh, separate brain cells and those are connected with one another. They often have like 6,000 connections, so um, <laughs> different from computing in that sense. And um, they communicate electrochemically. What that means is that there is an electrical signal when there is activity, in short. That's the basic of what you needed to know. Then to show you a few of the neurotechnologies that are out there, um, fMRI is one that you don't see out in the field. As you can see, it's a very big scanner. Essentially, this is a huge magnet. It's a rotating magnet. 
And what it does, it, it figures out where in your brain is the, the most activity. And it does, does that because, um, or let me explain it differently. In order to uh, have your brain activate in specific regions, the electrochemical signals have to go off, right? So that energy has to come from somewhere. And how it comes there is by uh, sending more blood there. But in the blood is oxygen, and in the oxygen is a tiny bit of iron. <laughs> and when uh, this this uh, fMRI machine, huge machines, you only find them in medical and academic labs, they identify that tiny bit of iron, have a few different ways to figure out exactly where the activity is. This is super reliable data, um, but it's not usable outside of the lab. And our goal today is mostly to figure out, okay, what is something we could be like, what is something you could be able to see in the upcoming future? Then another way that you can actually record brain data, because that's what we're talking about, right? You have reading and writing, and then here it's actually based on brain data. So we tend to think, and those um, electrical signals in our brain, that is activity, and that activity can be decoded by a computer. And another way in which, uh, which you actually see relatively often is EEG. So this is, well, you see the, the cute baby cap. Uh, it is a lot of different separate electrodes. Those are placed on your head. You have them wet and dry. Both are similar. It's, it's a different mechanism. Um, but in the end, it comes down to you pick up the electrical signals. And why so many tiny dots? Because they want to pick up all the specific regions, right? And um, the output of that is usually like it's so in the end, it's all binary, as you probably know better than I do. But uh, it can be with a a few mathematical tricks and some some uh, coding know-how, you can actually turn it into these useful graphs. And these are different kind of brain waves, if that makes sense. And uh, each of those brain waves stands for different activities. So that's how you can turn the neural data, so the brain data, into something useful, like a useful input for computer programs. Um, but as you can see, I also added a picture of like a, a, a search for EEG headset. And there are many different headsets that you can use because in the end, if you have a different use case and you only need to know what's going on in this part of the brain, you only need a headset that can put it here. And of course, it will be way less reliable than uh, what the baby has on, but it might suffice for the situation, right? So uh, that's a recurring theme that you will see. Then a third method is FNIRS. Um, let me stop here for one second and, and assure you, you don't need to remember all of these. The re reason I'm um, explaining them is so you have a bit of an idea what it's based on, because otherwise you will be lost in, in <laughs> okay, so how do we even get that data, right? So FNIRS is another method, um, relatively similar in terms, it also tracks the blood flow to see where the activity is, but then here it does it with infrared light. And here you get a bit of a different output because it's mostly a, a heat map of the brain. So uh, you get this heat map and you can see where there is more and less activity. Um, FNIRS is FNIRS and EEG, the two we just saw, those are actually things you can have out in the field. But FNIRS is uh, slightly less portable, it's, and it's also a bit more expensive. Um, and it's slightly slower, but it's more specific, right? So just to give you an idea, these different um, neurotechnologies also have different ways of um, di collecting data, the accuracy is different, all of those things. Then finally, the microarrays. Um, this might be the scariest picture in this uh, in this deck, so don't worry. It's this is where um, we make a different step sideways. So what you see in the medical world, this is absolutely not something we will see in consumers anytime soon, and I doubt ever. Um, but here. In essence, in essence, what it does is like, this is a tiny electrode, also picks up biometric data and then sends it to um, to the device that is connected. But this actually goes through the skull. So why would you ever go through the skull <laughs> to figure this out? Well, and that's why it won't be seen in the consumer market because this is something that's only useful when you have severe issues. So let's say the lady that you see here below, she's, uh, she's called Jen, a very famous patient in that sense. and after years of like doing these experiments, she was able to, uh, she has one of these microarrays in her head and um, she was able by merely thinking to use the robot arm to grab a drink and pour herself a drink and then put it back. 
which for us is not even an activity we think about, but for her, it makes the entire difference, of course. Uh, and to give an idea, there's only, and I'm, I'm, it's a rough guess, but only about 20 people in the world that have this. Um, so yeah, this is still very, very much in the early phases. Finally, how do these connect? Um, so what you care about mostly as a developer, I'm just categorizing here for a second, uh, is the accuracy of the data, right? If it's very good data, you can work with it better. And if it's, it's uh, well, inconsistent data, it doesn't really work that much. So I think it depends mostly on sensor technology. What kind of sensor do you use? Do you use the EEG? Do you use the uh, uh, microarrays? Or ECOG is essentially an EEG where they were like, hey, the scalp is in the way, let us put it through the scalp. Uh, but once again, there has to be a reason to do that. And also the proximity, because if you have put the same technology um, closer to the actual electrical signals and less of a skull, which is like a huge barrier for all the electrical activity, then you will get clearer data, right? And finally, uh, don't worry, there, <laughs> there are way more of these kinds of... Um, uh, yeah, well, brain imaging techniques. And uh, uh, you can actually, you can do more research on each one of these, but I think the, th the four that we've discussed are the most essential at the moment, right? These are names that you will find slightly less often. So that brings us to the second question. So if we know that Neurotech is this very broad, uh, broad group, then what is the brain computer interface? And, and as you can see here, it's a subset. Right, um, a small group of uh, neurotech is also brain computer interface, and here the biggest difference is mainly in whereas neurotech is about fundamentally changing how we think about our brain or how we operate with our brain, uh, brain computer interface is literally about making sure that your brain and the external device communicate. That's the key thing. Right? Lots of complicated words if you find it on, on uh, Wikipedia, but this is the essence. And um, that means essentially you're building an interface between your brain and your computer. And there are different ways to describe this. Some people say mind machine interface. Um, others I've heard like human machine interface, like all of these different kinds, but I think you will recognize them from now on. I see that it's all about the same kind of category. And what this essentially is and what it's used for, um, is just we like right now essentially every technology usually starts with um helping the people that need it most right and i think that's absolutely how it should be so in this case the same thing so who needed most well let's say someone with locked in syndrome um who is paralyzed entirely cannot show any sign of communication but based on the brain waves we can actually see that that person is alive and is thinking well, that's a relatively horrible, that's, that's a horrible way to live, right? And this is the kind of technology that has, um, we will actually see one of the startups that has done this, which is a Dutch startup. Um, and that is actually, they give these patients the ability to once again communicate simply by thinking they can, for example, type, which is amazing, right? So then suddenly they can communicate with the outside world. Same thing with someone who is totally paralyzed um, you can remove the sensory motor functions. So what you just saw with Jen, who being able to like uh, grab the cup, that's essentially sensory motor, motor functions. So motor is more about like your motorics, like how can you move and, and move your arms, etc. Whereas your sensory is more about the, the senses themselves, uh, smelling, also amazing things that we can do with this. Uh, for example, someone who is blind, but in the end for our brain, everything is the same kind of pattern. Um, and what you see is that they found they built a device that uh, a rock climber could put on their tongue, which would send the same kind of signals as their eyes would um, uh, process. And because it was sent on another sensory organ, this is an unbelievable story, but simply because they sensed it there, the brain automatically adapts, right? Says so like, okay, hey, I know these kind of patterns. And suddenly that person who is fully blind can see somewhat again. Right, this kind of stuff is now slowly possible, but it's mostly in the academic labs and the medical universities, which means you don't hear about it that much. Okay, let's dive into a few examples. Um, I think Neuralink is the one that, if you've heard about this field, most likely you've heard of Neuralink. So this is what Elon Musk started. That's also why it became uh, well, instantly world famous. And um, what they're focusing on essentially is like, 
making sure that there is higher bandwidth. So they looked at the field, um, saw that the biggest issue right now, at least according to them, um, was that too little information could be sent into the computer to actually be useful on a grander scale. So let's say if you can only pick up uh, from just a few neurons, just a few places in the brain, um, that really doesn't give you that much information. Can be if it's the perfect ones. And what they're trying to figure out is how can we find more effective methods of actually extracting this kind of information. Um, all of this is, is very, very, uh, very innovative and very sensitive topics, I think, and rightly so. So that's, in my mind, the reason why we should talk about this more than we do now, if that makes sense, because now it's just silently happening. Whereas if people talk about it, there will be some kind of uh, conversation and rules, I hope. <laughs> Quick uh, in between. As for kernel, so we talked about Neuralink. Um, what you see, Neuralink was also started by, by Elon Musk. And that's also, he saw that there was a huge opportunity here and then just said, okay, perfect. So use my business know-how, use my team. Here's the funding, build it. Kernel is very similar in a sense. Uh, kernel is a very mysterious company. We don't know exactly what they do, but they offer neuroscience as a service. So what they did is they built an entire team of all the different kind of people within neuroscience and, and neurotechnology, brain computer interface, and made sure that they could provide companies, governments, uh, academic institutes with the best kind of research possible, whatever they wanted within this realm. And they also built some devices. So what you see here on the right is the kernel flow i want to say yes kernel flow they have two products kernel flux and kernel flow um and same thing so this uses fnirs this uses fnirs that we talked about before and each one of those tiny uh, uh pointers that you see those are one of the sensors right so as you can see this will bring a lot of data with it and this is a very high-tech company as well and then finally open bci uh, which personally I'm, I'm quite a big fan of. They uh, offer open source solutions. So they have a, a somewhat similar approach in terms of more people need to know about this. How can we democratize it? And they built this headset. Uh, we're actually negotiating with them whether to buy one of these headsets. And um, you can also 3D print part of it. This is something that many of you will like if you're interested into hardware, I think, because this is, yeah, very cool stuff. Okay. We saw a few of the um, neurotech and brain computer interface plays, right? So how can we categorize this? How, how can you make sense of what's happening out there? Because there's, it's being used for so many different use cases. And also, as you, if you think about it, it's an interface, right? It's an interface between you and the world. So whereas back in the day, you would have your, um, your mainframe computer somewhere else. Now you have your laptop and then often you have your phone and you do it, but you can even speak into it. The next uh, generation or the next era will most likely be something along the lines of thinking it, which has a lot of different implications. And uh, the question is, how slowly do we creep towards it? Because you do see a lot of, developments that way if you like facebook bought uh, a brain computer interface company mostly to allow people to share their thoughts instantly which is not the use case i'm the most fan of um but also google but uh, um let me think i don't remember the name now but google also worked on this i know microsoft worked on this so also some of the bigger companies are actually spending more time on this so it's useful for all of us to have a bit of an idea so what are some of the ways that it's used, right? So first off, in medical realm, I showed you a few examples before. Uh, I think this is a super cool startup. It's Dutch, uh, Mind Effect. And what they did, they started with the locked-in syndrome. So they started with people in the, in the top, as you can see, uh, people who were entirely paralyzed and couldn't communicate whatsoever. Um, and then by just thinking, they can actually figure this out. So how this works exactly is a very long and complex story. But in short, it comes down to they um, give the person who is looking at the screen, they they give them a pattern in terms of there's a lot flashing on the screen and, and say like, okay, focus on this, think about this. Thereby, they can record when you think about this, your brain structure looks like this, right? And then later on, they just have one for yes, one for no, and then 
when for me, for example, when I want to say yes, I just have to think about that thing that I associated with yes, could be a pink elephant, which triggers a specific way of thinking, right? Um, that's in super short. And what they started with the uh, entirely medical, this was actually a spin off from the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And now they are actually also building a maker's kit. So, with uh, they have um, a GitHub page, which I'll show you later. And also, um, yeah, they're just making this, as far as I know, they're trying to like share it with everyone. So, I think there's even an SDK. Then, I think this is something that some of you will be very excited about. Uh, Neurable. This is one of the, the hottest startups in this realm, and understandably so, because what they do is they combine um, virtual reality and brain computer interface. So this is something that I've seen for a while as well. In, in terms of like the VR industry, they notice that um, they are missing some of the sensory input, right? So you can definitely see all ways around and they're trying to integrate more and more senses to make it a more coherent experience. But one of the biggest differences between real life and a VR experience is that you, um, in real life, you don't have to think that much about everything and, and things automatically kind of go. And here they want to integrate this as well, right? So, and this is actually where you, without moving at all, you can still throw things, pick things up. And of course, it's still the basics right now. You cannot walk and all of that, um, but it's a very good beginning. So that's that. It's also being used in business. Uh, to give you an idea, this can be in the realm of neuromarketing where uh, the effectiveness of ads is being tracked by people looking at it, for example, right? So um, yeah, I think that, that speaks for itself. But there's also more, more interesting things happening, um, which well, feel free to share your opinions later on. Uh, the Enterprise Neurotechnology Solutions, as you see below, that's actually uh, an, a solution that they offer to companies, right? So then uh, a company can give part of their workforce one of these, which tracks how they, uh, their levels of focus, concentration, attention, uh, all of those kind of brain states, if that makes sense. Um, think for yourself what you think about this. Then there's wellness. Um, this is one of the things that I'm personally quite excited about. So I don't know whether any of you meditate, but one of the biggest issues in meditation uh, or one of the recurring obstacles is that you tend to drift away, you tend to focus, then you drift away and you don't remember that you're drifting away, right? And it can be a minute later, it can be three seconds later, but it can also be that you're just out for four minutes, you have no idea, so the time rings and then you're like, ah, oh, damn. So <laughs> what they do here is, very great. They use neurofeedback to give you, um, yeah, well, they give you feedback on how you're doing, right? So you have this headband on, which tracks um, your state of consciousness, in essence, or your state of attention or awareness, I would say. And um, when it's mentally still, the sounds will decrease and it will become a more calm nature-like state. Whereas when your mind is racing, the sound will increase. And that's on a very subtle, that's not something you think about that consciously, but on a subconscious level, this is extremely effective in changing your behavior because you're like, oh, I don't want it to be louder. So, okay, okay, true. And you don't forget it for four minutes, for example. Um, and they even have like, when you have a very clear mind, then you hear birds chirping. And then the second you get excited, they leave again, right? So, so all of these tiny feedback loops, which are super useful. Um, one thing to interject when I go one slide back with emotive and also with Muse, but I think mostly with emotive, most of these devices also, no, I wouldn't say most, some of these devices also offer an SDK. So you can actually, or an API, so that you can actually build your own kind of uh, interfaces and everything with it. So that's definitely worth checking out. And then especially open BCI. And uh, finally, I think it's also useful to show, oh, well, I have one interesting one after this, sports, um, Halo Neuroscience, what they built is they use, instead of neurofeedback, they use neurostimulation. So that's the more, I would say, complex part of, um, uh, of brain computer interface, because we talked about reading and writing the, da uh, the brain data. Well, writing brain data is way, way in the future, right? We have no idea how to do it yet, uh, only kind of like through a brute force approach, which is useful for someone who has an epileptic seizure uh, because then they can just send a shockwave in essence and it stops the seizure. Well, that's amazing, right? But for most 
normal everyday activities, that's just not an option. <laughs> and this is something where they did find uh, an interesting application. So the idea behind this is that all motoric control, all movement is learned in the same way. So whether you're playing guitar, whether you're playing basketball, or uh, in my case, whether you do martial arts, it's all the same kind of way that your brain remembers it. And it mostly goes through muscle memory, et cetera. So what this does, it stimulates the part of your brain that is responsible for muscle memory and makes sure that you remember it better. And they have some scientific studies to, see, to, to demonstrate that it actually works, that people pick up things faster. Right, so this is, and to give you an idea, most of these devices that I just showed are in the price range of 400 bucks, uh, except for kernel, Neuralink, those are uh, <laughs> nearly impossible to buy. And then uh, OpenBCI is actually quite doable. It's even cheap, like that's about 1500, but then you have more options. And finally, uh, this is something I definitely wanted to share with you. Um, so Neurosity is building a, a headset. They offer it as well. This is also an EEG headset and they, I think they call it thought powered app development or something along those lines. The idea here is to actually provide developers a helmet, which allows them to seamlessly integrate this brain data into their programs. And uh, I'm not a real developer in that sense. I did some, some Python coding in the evenings and I started the computational neuroscience course, but I'm definitely not at your level, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't know exactly how all of this works, but I wanted to bring this to your attention because I think this is something that's very interesting. And if you learn something new and cool, let me know. Okay, this is just a small subset of what's out there, right? This is the, 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 the industry overview. Um, as you can see, a ridiculous amount of different Kind of startups and businesses but many of these are from the medical realm i would say literally about 80 to 90 percent are from the medical realm um which means that there's still a lot of opportunity um then about timing right so if you get excited about uh, the things that i'm explaining here then it could be that you're like okay i might want to experiment a bit i want to get into this kind of like field uh <laughs> Am I on time? <laughs> Is it already way too late? So first off, let me share a story that the um, uh, like the founder of a big company shared with me. He told me that in the beginning, uh, his company revolves entirely about the internet. And in the beginning, he started about 25 years ago. Um, he told me that back then, he was super afraid that he missed the train of the internet. He was like, okay, the internet is already built. The people are already there. Uh, how can I get into this, right? And now he actually has one of the biggest companies in that realm. So that actually also, also made me think like, first off, you're probably never really too late unless it's something that that uh, really isn't useful in about 10 years. But this is something that's only just starting. So uh, when we talk about the neurotech itself, so FM, I think fMRI uh, no, EEG was actually built in the 50s, 1950s, and then fMRI and fNIRS were mostly in 1990s. Microarray, I don't know, but I think more recently. Um, and it it sped up in the past about 20, year, uh, 20 years, mostly through brain scanning or brain imaging. Uh, but also now the BCI trend is actually hopping up quite a bit. Um, I think another way that's useful to think about this, I don't know whether I... Yeah, I can move this. So another way that's useful to think, I don't know whether any of you know this, the Gardner hype cycle. Uh, I've always found this a relatively interesting graph. And what they do, they uh, have these phases where every new technology goes through and they plot them. So of course it's slightly subjective and all of this, um, but it's useful to have an idea. So I picked 2019 and 2020. In 2019, there is no brain computer interface. It's not a thing. Right? So this is one of the biggest um, uh, consulting companies in the world and, and, and totally focused on this emerging technology field. They don't see brain computer interface whatsoever. They do have something which comes close, which is, uh, let me see, it's automated, augmented intelligence, which comes close. It's like improved intelligence. Then in 2020, uh, augmented intelligence is gone and there's a two-way brain machine interface. So that is even more in the, like more at the beginning of this trough of uh, disillusionment, uh, as they call it. And um, 
It's more in the beginning. And here they say it will peak in about five to 10 years. Whereas in 2019 with augmented intelligence, they said it will peak in about two to five years. Just to give you an idea. So no, the world isn't clear on where we are in the cycle, but we are early enough that we don't have a clear answer yet, right? I think that's the answer in itself. Um, oh, yeah, works. And so, yeah, like I said, I think it's super early and there's still a lot of room to like come up with new innovations. And as you can see, like, so we talked about like the EEG and the FNIRs. Um, a lot of the experts actually predict that we're going to combine some of these systems. So sometimes there's actually already combinations of both, where you have both EEG and FNIRS data, uh, clean them up, put them together, and then turn them into useful insights. Because um, that will give you a more coherent view on what's actually going on in the brain, right? Then finally, like I think the overall kind of trend that you're seeing is that in the past, few years, I would say, past five, maybe 10 years, there are actually um, a few people who really, really try to push this into the world, right? So Elon Musk is, of course, the well-known person, but that's been uh, relatively recently. He's, he's a relative rookie in this field, right? But he has a team of all-stars, so that's the other side. Uh, Brian Johnson in the left bottom, um, that's the guy who started Kernel. Uh, he he started a credit card company before I sold that to PayPal and then decided, okay, this is what the world needs. Let me just build this. And he's been working on this for a very long time. Uh, interesting dude. On the right bottom, he, <laughs> Ramses Al-Qaeda, also a very interesting figure. He built Neurable. Uh, so he's more on the gaming kind of side. And then top left is uh, Tan Lee and she is from Emotive. So what they're all trying to do is they kind of get it out of the lab, make sure that it's not just such a super complex thing that cannot be understood, cannot be used, and try to simplify it, right? Um, and this is slowly what you start to see with more and more different kinds of devices for different use cases. Okay, I think this was the, the biggest part of the, uh, of the talk, right? And now I wanna give you a few concrete pointers in terms of, let's say you're excited about this and you wanna do a bit more about it. Um, feel free to reach out. But first, I want to give you some pointers so you can work on it yourself, right? Learn a bit more. And this is exact. This is pretty much my personal journey in terms of the things that have been super useful for me, some of them. Um, so first off, I mentioned this before, you can find a lot of code on Brain Computer Interface on GitHub, right? So MindEffect is one example. Uh, that's just Dutch startup and uh, but you also have OpenBCI and there's there's way more. There's also a lot of EEG data there uh, because that's essentially what you need, right? It's very hard to start experimenting with this kind of stuff if you don't have a helmet, but you can experiment with it. You just need to download raw EEG data sets, if that makes sense, or uh, something different. Um, so this is useful, especially because you will find others who are also working on this. This was one of my personal favorites. So. Uh, OpenBCI is where you can buy the, the headset. This guy, Sendex, I didn't necessarily know him, um, but he built a three part, I think, three or four part series on how he opened the OpenBCI headset and started coding. I think this is exactly, if you're interested in this, this is what you want to see. Because you will just have an hour and a half of this guy talking to you, talking out loud, explaining what he's doing. Uh, you can see some of the code. Um, to do a quick sidestep, by the way, for Brain Computer Interface, the things that are most useful, because I'm not a coder myself, but I do know some of these things. C, uh, those languages are good, right? So C, C++, uh, C Sharp, uh, a lot of Python. Uh, MATLAB is used quite a bit for the arrays. And um, Node and Java. <laughs> So there you go, quite quite a few different kinds of languages, right? But I think with Python and MATLAB, you can do a very, you can, can make a very big head start. Then this is one article that we wrote ourselves. Um, Simon is, uh, he's also someone who works in the brain computer interface industry. So um, he simplified in essence what this is about and how we can kind of use it. I think if you're more curious about the science behind it, this will be a great article. 
I didn't want to get into that too much because I think limited information, limited attention, and uh, uh, there are a lot of cool things to show here, so I would focus on that. But this is where you can understand a bit more about how this, especially the sensor technology works exactly. Okay, and then what has been the most useful for me personally is starting this course, Computational Neuroscience at the University of Washington. Uh, you can find it at Concer on uh, Coursera, but I think first off, it's ridiculous that we live in an era where we have access to the best information in the world, right? And these are just some of the, the some of the biggest experts explaining to you exactly how it works. And um, yeah, it's it's a pain in the ass. I'll be honest. <laughs> yes, I had to go back quite a bit to actually uh, redo my linear algebra and all those things. And I also because of busyness with with the, uh, the business and Corona, um, I had to like I did about two and a half weeks, but I'm still going to pick it up. But if it was doable for me without a background in technology, then it's doable for you. Trust me. So if you're curious, pick this up. It's a free course. Uh, it's amazing. Then you have the Neurotech X Slack. Uh, I talked a bit about this before. This is if you want to meet others who are also working on this, this is the way to go. Um, I tried a lot of different things. I tried reaching out on LinkedIn and that also works. But this is where a lot of active people are asking their questions. So even if you um, join the Slack and end up not really like uh, engaging that much, you will find a lot of different inspiration because these are just worldwide people working on this. And finally, uh, last thing. So with Neurotech X, uh, so I'm the chapter lead. So I, I sent them a message, saw that it was a super cool initiative. They have a lot of uh, very big names as well who are willing to speak there. Uh, it's still a small industry, right? So everyone is kind of willing to help each other out. And what they did very well is just start with the scientific community. And now it's a huge community with so many different knowledgeable people. So I thought, okay, why don't we have these meetups in the Netherlands? Uh, sent them a message and uh, uh, the founders uh, got excited. So so now I'm setting it up here in the Netherlands. And last week, I actually did the first event with someone from MindEffect uh, and, and yeah, an ex-investor from uh, New York. And this is where you can actually see some of the, you can meet some people, but as for now, it's mostly online. And we're also considering hack nights. Uh, this is something a bit more complex. Um, so, so I'm open to ideas here, but it comes down to if we can get some of the devices in a room and you have a bunch of people who are interested in this, uh, we could just start building together, right? We could just start hacking some things together. And I'm actually in contact with a few of the BCI device suppliers to see whether I can get free devices. Um, so this is uh, something for in the future. If anyone is interested, feel free to let me know. Okay, now we're at, at, the, at the tail end. Um, so it might be that you've seen this uh, presentation and we're like, okay, yes, perfect. So you're working on Neurified. How does that connect with this whole BCI thing? Uh, which is a very reasonable question. Um, also a question which I ask myself a lot, <laughs> right? Because uh, I think like there are a few key points, right? So what we do is like we simplify behavioral psychology and neuroscience and make it practical. So in the end, make sure that the scientific insights aren't just there and then lost, that it's actually being used in the world. And I think the number one thing that we focus on uh, is cognitive biases, systematic judgment errors or systematic thinking patterns, if that makes sense. Um, that's something for a different presentation. But that's what we tend to focus on a lot. I assume that many of you will not have heard of cognitive biases, then let it be. Um, but what we are trying to figure out is whether with the the um, level of like neuroplasticity, which is essentially our brain can change, uh, our brain can change itself. So back in the day, they thought that kids were the only ones that could learn. And then when you're grown up, it's done. Now we know differently, right? We know about growth mindset and all of those things. And we want to figure out whether we can train people to systematically reduce their own bias, which could be huge, right? Um, and we're, we're still in the orienting phase in the beginning, uh, talking with a few experts, figuring out what kind of BCI paradigm to use. If any of you has an idea what I'm talking about here and is super excited about this, reach out, please, because then I think, most likely, I think you're a very cool person as well. So let's get in touch. Okay, we're at the end. And um, <laughs> I know that like, this is from the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I've always, I've loved that book very much. And um, I wanted to let you know, like, so when you see a long presentation like this, 
uh, at least for me, the first time I had like, oh, damn, but this is already all here. Okay, so then, Jesus, what will be there in about five years? There is no mind reading helmet yet. Um, there is no uh, real indication that this will be here in the upcoming three to five years. There's definitely no reason to be afraid uh, that they, anyone can plant thoughts in your mind or that can write brain data. All of that stuff is not there. And also same thing with like the invasive, non-invasive BCI. I don't think those are things that you have to wor worry about uh, anytime soon. All right, that was it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, it was a pleasure and answer the questions, I assume. I will quit this so I can see the chat. All right. Oh, I see some activity. That's good. <laughs> nice. Um, all right. I'll pick. I don't see <laughs> mind controlling helmets. Uh, yeah, in terms of all these EEG devices, in essence, are like tiny helmets that you put on, right? Uh, or, or a headband or something along those lines. It's very easy to confuse them with like mind control, if that makes sense, even though it's definitely not that. But you can control objects with your mind. That's definitely possible. But it's not, um, you cannot change how people tend to think so far. You don't have to worry about that part. Okay. Um, neurofeedback, meditate, daydream. Neurosky. Yes. Neurosky is somewhere. We built a database of the. Uh, BCI devices and uh, companies that we found. Neurosky was one of them. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, yes, I know it. If there's a specific question, feel free to let me know. Then for uh, Tessa, if you want to work in this field as a developer, is there specific, uh, specific stuff you should learn besides Python, MATLAB, etc., and specific skills you should have? Okay, so um, the biggest misconception here is that you have to be a neuroscience expert. You don't have to be a neuroscience expert. Um, you just have to, so so. I think one of the most important things here is signal processing. You need to be very good at signal processing. That's key here. And um, yeah, I think the best preparation is literally twofold. Personally, that's at least what I do. On the one hand, do the computational neuroscience course at University of Washington, because that's a very good way to actually figure out whether you want to get into the field as well, right? You'll have to work with all the matrices and, and, and the arrays, et cetera. Um, for me, it was not necessarily that fun. It was just, I'm passionate about the topic, therefore I could get through it, right? Um, but I think that's that will give you the fundamental kind of knowledge to work on this kind of stuff. Um, and the other part is meet others who work on interesting stuff. And I think that's why, that's actually why I joined Neurotech X and why I said, okay, I want to build a community here in the Netherlands because um, you learn most from other people. That's what I found so far. I learned way more from the other people that are working on interesting things. Um, so yeah, that. And also one useful story here. I also met a guy from India. Um, he finished his high school and then just started doing online courses. <laughs> I thought this was amazing. So he just started doing online courses, same thing, mostly autodidactic, same whereas I read most books, he was only doing the online courses. Uh, he ended up being a computational neuroscience now at a very prestigious company. So just to give an idea, uh, I say that a lot, I'm gonna refrain from saying that, but um, even the ex there are so few experts in this world right now that if you understand the basics and have a bit of an idea of of the use cases or what it could be used for then i think there are a lot of places where you can actually do something um, yes thank you very much for all the uh, thank you thank you thank you highly appreciate it uh, will you share the presentation with us? Yes, I will share the presentation with us. I was uh, uh, waiting for you to let me know. Yes, we'll do. Uh, then you can figure everything out. Then you can see all the things. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. That'll work. Um, what's the craziest application of Neurotech you can think of? And what are the ethical concerns we need to already take into account? Oh, that's a question. <sighs> craziest application. Um, so if you want to hear some of the 
crazy applications, it might be interesting to watch the uh, Neuralink demo. So uh, from Elon Musk, Neuralink has a few demos and they, they uh, at the end, they have a, a question round where all the experts and Elon uh, also answer a few questions. One of the questions is, what is the thing you're looking forward to the most? So I think my opinion here could be interesting. Their opinion is way more interesting, but I'll pick one of them. Um, and I think <laughs> two things. On the one hand, telepathy could be super interesting. And I don't expect this to happen anytime soon. But essentially, if you look at how artificial intelligence can already derive some of the semantics behind words, um, then it's not a weird idea to think that when you can do this directly from the brain, then you can also somewhat like transfer the meaning. And I think something along those lines could be super interesting. On a personal level, uh, <laughs> one of the biggest issues in my life has been that my mind tends to race, tends to go quickly, ta -ta 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 -ta, and uh, I've always had somewhat of an obsession with capturing more of the ideas that uh, uh, bounce around. So for me personally, I would be most excited about um, a kind of device or software program which could ride out what I'm thinking. Um, yeah. That's for me personally. Uh, ethical concerns. <laughs> okay, nice. I think ethical concerns um, is something we should think about absolutely. Uh, I think it's something that quite a few people think about very seriously. Uh, there's also a few cowboys in this field, right? Um, in terms of just, just playing around, having no idea what they're exactly doing. Um, there are a few neurotech ethics people and also neuroethics. That's actually the field, right? Where, where it's about like applying neuroscience. Um, you can find more interesting things about this. On a personal level, I think at some point the government should get involved. Uh, <laughs> but that, that's more of a personal thing because everything, if you look at a bunch of things that if you leave it fully, <laughs> fully in the hands of everyone, then there will always be opportunistic people. Uh, if you look at the capitalistic system, relatively concentrated. So giving those two factors, I would say, make sure that it's good before it actually is there, right? But I'm not a politician. Um, okay. The question remains whether free will exists. Yes, that's something I can also give an entire presentation about, but I will refrain myself from doing that today. What kind of current projects is Nerf at working on right now? Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> very broad. So we're working with, I'm just going to give you a, a few ideas. Uh, I gave a talk last week at Nayado University on neuroleadership, which is effective decision making under uh, uncertainty and stress. Then we're working with a chatbot designer to, uh, or a chatbot builder, like a very big one who works for major car companies, etc. Uh, on how we can make the, how we can increase the conversational fluency. So how can you make sure that people, um, let's say like how can you make sure that the the conversation works way better for example when it's a chatbot for lonely people right because that's a lot of psychology behind it and that's what we do as well we're also training cybersecurity consultants because in the end most of the issues within cybersecurity are actually people making mistakes most of the time from biases uh resulting from biases we're doing a very big behavioral change campaign with PVH, which is Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger, working with a bunch of different departments, uh, including the tech and the tech support um, in terms of how we can, it's, it's in the context of digital transformation, right? So digital stuff, a lot of people need to change their behavior and they uh, got us in. So a group of neuropsychologists who are working with them to facilitate this entire process. Um, and yeah, like we have an online course, that's interesting. Um, might be interesting to check out. If anyone of you is interested in the online course, feel free to send me a message because we don't want to make that much money on the students, right? So I'll, I'll be able to get you some, some very doable, uh, doable kind of deal. Um, and finally, I think, yeah, neurotech, honestly, because long-term goal is getting into neurotechnology and brain computer interface and uh, midterm goal is integrating that technology into our current services and, and product portfolio, which is mostly about making sure that we integrate this, let's say, in our trainings. How cool would a training be if you don't only hear about this behavioral psychology and neuroscience of effective decision making, but also can see notable changes based on an interface? I think that's 
very interesting. So uh, that's something we're working on as well. To what extent do you think neuroplasticity training is possible? Can you get a 30 year old to learn like a five year old? Very good question. Very good question. Um, I see the two as very different questions though. The second question, uh, I think no. I think there are neuroscientific differences. There are literally in, in terms of how your brain is structured and how your brain operates. Uh, a five-year-old brain is just more plastic than um, a 30-year-old brain. So no, it will not be the exact same. But you can learn, like uh, let's say differently, we have a lot of limiting beliefs about how much people can change, right? And if you look at someone like Wim Hof, which is a Dutch legend, uh, he literally changes how we think about this stuff. And that's literally because he, he's he's a bit crazy in a very good way, right? And uh, that's why he doesn't think it's impossible. And that's why he tries to do it. I think we have a very similar kind of situation with neuroplasticity. Uh, if you truly try and, and, and put the right kind of environment around it, we can learn amazing things. Uh, think about the 84-year-old people who are actually still very ripped and can do pull-ups and everything. I think it's all about what you really kind of want to do. Uh, up to a point, of course. Okay, then, as a fan of Ghost in the Shell, i got to ask, have you watched it? <laughs> if yes, how close is it to the actual state of affairs? Uh, I haven't watched it. So thank you. I will write this down. Ghost in the Shell. Um and I will check this out because I'm very curious. I've never heard of this, uh, so it could be this. <laughs> Programming without a keyboard. Yes, let's make sure you get that. Chatbot facilitation and chatbot for loneliness. Yes, it's called Kletzbot. Uh, Kletzbot, I'll write it in the chat. That's one of the initiatives. Then um, can you tell us a bit more on how it might be possible to stimulate a growth mindset block of fixed mindset? Very good question. Um, this is something we do have in some of our trainings. I'm not the biggest expert on this topic in the team, but I think most of it comes down to, to beliefs, right? So uh, very similar to, I've always seen a lot of similarities between psychology and technology, because whereas with technology, you have different, um, what is the big innovation of one day will later on be just a module in another bigger building block, right? Which will in turn, et cetera, and that will keep on going. Um, with human thinking is very similar, but the thing is, it's very fuzzy. So that's what we try to concretize at Nerfight. And um, growth mindset is, is a hard one because it's such a limiting belief in terms of how long it has often been there. But I think there are a few key things. First off, try to catch yourself in the act anytime you say or think anything along the lines of, yeah, but that's it, that is how it is, <laughs> right? Anything along those lines, stop yourself. Uh, just observe it, at least. Let it be there. That's all fine. But observe it. See that you're doing it. And um, I think what's key to know here, I'm someone with an extreme growth mindset. But at times, I totally forget it. And then I become very fixed mindset. And then I become sad. And then I, at some point, I snap out of it. And then I'm like, what are you doing? Get back to the, to the good kind of thing. And then boom. And then I'm back in the growth mindset. So I think the biggest thing here comes down to awareness and uh, there are a lot of articles that will give you more information on exactly how to tackle uh, a fixed mindset, but I think awareness will be the biggest thing. So um, might want to pick up meditation with or without the $400 Muse headband. Uh, what meditation do you use? Or uh, I don't use an app. I'm, I'm the kind of stubborn guy who just wants to do my own kind of thing. Uh, here, same thing. I looked... Um, and, and what kind of huge videos. I have used one app for a while, by the way, that is very good. Um, Insight Timer. I'll also put this in the chat. Insight Timer is the free app. So you have Calm, you have Headspace. Those are the two big players, both funded by Silicon Valley, venture capital companies, of course. Thereby, there's a big interest to make money. Thereby, it will become more and more money kind of making machine. Uh, personally, I wanted to get into um, Insight Timer because this is mostly, uh, this is just a free one. Free and it's open source. And uh, I think, well, I don't know whether it's open source, but it's definitely free. Does human state of mind, human emotions, influence BCI or can BCI change a human emotion? A very good, very complicated question. Um, I think about BCI slightly differently. I think BCI is not necessarily 
Well, okay. Yes. <laughs> Let me tackle it differently. Yes. Because I think what you can think about is this. Your brain is a machine that's working anyway, right? Keeps on going, keeps on going. Then what you can do is put a device on top of it, let's call it a BCI, which picks up the signals and then sends it uh, or does something with the signals. Usually it sends it to some external device. Uh, and then there will be something, right? What that something is differs for every company, for every use case, for every device, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, depending on the use case, yes, it can definitely change your, your emotion. So let's say, let's think of a theoretical BCI where, uh, I'm building something. I have a, I have this OpenBCI headset, and uh, there, and I'm, I'm making a few assumptions here, so I could be wrong, but I think it's useful for for the case. Um, let's say that when I set, I have a specific brain pattern, which I can measure with the, that EEG headset. Then this device will recognize when I'm set, right? Um, and then when I'm set, I could uh, build is uh, build kind of like into the algorithm and if this then that statement where when I'm set, this music will come up. Uh, I don't know whether, whether that'll be a good or a bad thing, but that could indeed change your, uh, your thinking. So yes, I think through that feedback loop, absolutely. Uh, on a more direct level, something I've thought about more as a person is um, that computers just comes way, like technology comes closer to us and it also fundamentally changes how we think, how we think about ourselves and, and how we generally tend to think. Um, I do think BCI will have a way shorter feedback loop than most of the other technologies that we have right now. So your laptop or your phone, uh, you will at least have to open it with my big fingers, touch the tiny things. Whereas um, with BCI, I will think something, it'll be there. And if you look at some of the developments um, of, of asymmetric information, in terms of not everyone has the same information. I think, for example, the knowledge about biases. Biases are essential. They are so fundamental in understanding how people think. But now most people don't know anything about biases, whereas the big tech companies know everything about biases and try to leverage it in their favor. Uh, and the rest of society is not even aware of it. I think that's not a not a good kind of thing. Um, so yes, I also think BCI changes how we think, not necessarily our emotion. Um, how could you use these new technologies to recover from traumatic brain injury? Um, very good question. I think this is the first one that I won't be able to, to give a good answer to. Uh, I'm sure you can find this though. It's a good question, so you can definitely uh, uh, Google this. Or I can, I can do research later because I'm curious as well. Uh, but I don't have the answer right now. Um, when will I be able to become a cyborg? Um, depends very much on how cyborgy you want to be, I think. <laughs> no, so it, it, it depends, right? So uh, there are some self-proclaimed cyborgs already, <laughs> right? Yeah, get a pay. <laughs> okay, I'll let you <laughs> figure this out. Uh, finally, do you know if there is research if BCI could be used to treat mental issues like depression or PTSD? Yes, 100%. Um, I've been talking a lot about the cool use cases, right? But I'm not as shallow to think that those are the things that should be the th that that should be built first. Um, technology should first help those that are truly in need, and I think those with, let's say locked in syndrome or, or paralysis, that's the most intense kind of thing. And then um, they're also working with depression and PTSD. Yes, I know I know exactly what this is about, but um, I didn't get too much into the medical industry myself because I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I know that there are other entrepreneurs who will do way better in the medical arena than I would. So um, I, uh, <laughs> I pick my battles, uh, but yes, definitely there is research being done. If you Google something along the lines of neurotech or BCI and PTSD or N uh, depression, you will find which ones. All right? Did I miss a question or did we have everything? All right. Perfect. Then thank you for your attention, everyone. Uh, I hope this this was interesting for you and and got a bunch of new ideas in your in your head that you'd never thought about. Um, feel free to reach out. Like I said before. Um, yeah. Simple as that.
Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Good to hear. Good to hear. Yes, the Hack Knights. That might be something. Uh, I'm just throwing this out there. Uh, this could be something if more people at Kodam uh, are interested in this, we could figure out whether that's something we can in some ways collaborate in. Um, all right, I'm happy to see all these messages. Thank you very much. I'm gonna have a good evening as well. And uh, uh, oh, I even see an interest on that. Perfect, let's do it. Okay, see all of you soon. And if any of you still has a question, I'm available on LinkedIn or on email, bye at nerfight.com. All right, great evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>